Okay, seeing we got a good group going. We are going to kick off because we got a lot to do today. Welcome everyone. My name is Laura Raleigh and I serve as Director of Life Science Economic Development at the North Carolina Biotechnology Center and co-lead our North Carolina CRO Collaborative with my colleague Vivian Doling. And we are so appreciative to have you all here for our first of NC Biotech CRO Career Conversations. Despite North Carolina's leadership in contract research, the industry and its career opportunities remain elusive to many. And through this event series, we will be inviting professionals from the CRO industry to speak candidly about their own experiences and to provide you all with more information about the many career opportunities that exist. As far as logistics for the event, we recommend using Zoom's gallery view during the conversation to allow you to see all of our panelists. And while the attendees are muted to avoid those potential disruptions that I think we've all become a little too familiar with, we encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A function. There is also an option to upvote questions. So if you see someone else submit a question that you're also curious about, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. We're planning to devote the last 15 minutes or so of our time together to answer questions, and we're going to prioritize those that have the most likes. Without further delay, I am going to now turn it over to our moderators, Dana and Christine, to introduce themselves and to kick off tonight's discussion all about Clinical Research Associates, also known as CRAs. Dana, Christine, go ahead. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'll kick it off and then turn it over to Dana. Um, so my name is Christine Cantu and I'm with Cineos Health. I have been with Cineos for a little over a year, just past the one year anniversary in January. Um, and it's definitely been a whirlwind starting a job and then six weeks later going to 100% remote, but working for a CRO in a pandemic has definitely been a very uh, rewarding and humbling experience. Um, and I joined Cineos for us to start um, specifically carving out early talent programs um, within the CRO industry. Dana, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Christine. So hello everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Dana Glisson. I work for Covance at Lab, by LabCorp. Um, I'm currently a regional vice president there for a clinical operations organization um, for the Americas region. I've been in the CRO industry for uh, probably close to you know, 14 years, been in healthcare and research over 26, so I'm aging myself. Um, so certainly excited about where we're going. We thought we would kick off uh, the discussion just kind of simply talking about some terms you're gonna hear over and over again. Uh, one of them being uh, the, we'll talk a little bit about the CRO and sponsor. So what we're, the CRO industry is what we call the contract research organization. Uh, and what we do here is we really sponsor um, and we work with our sponsoring companies and we contract with them to actually run clinical trials. So when we talk about our sponsors, we're meaning our pharmaceutical industry, um, but it also is medical device, biotechnology. We sometimes sponsor with our you know, government agencies, universities to run clinical research. And the great thing about being a CRO for our sponsors is the fact that when they're, they really look to us for that, that expertise in clinical research. So they really are confident in the fact that we can run their clinical trial with, with safely and efficiently. Um, and then if you think about clinical trials, you know, sometimes these trials are only up for maybe a year. So it really supports our sponsors so that they're not out having to hire permanent staff to run their clinical trials. Now, CROs uh, can do multiple different things. So they can do full service, what we call for full service. So project management, monitoring, biostats, data management. But our sponsors can also just contract for just specific things that they want. If it's just monitoring and, and project management of their clinical trial, maybe it's just biostats or data management. So then, then we wanted to talk a little also about a clinical site. So you're going to hear the term site. Uh, clinical site, PI site, um, and those are all terms that we actually use for when we actually have a study, we actually have to go out to sites and get participation, right? So we work with our clinical sites, 
Uh, and those are the sites that actually enroll our clinical into the clinical trial. So they enroll patients. Sites may include hospital settings. They could be a standalone research center, um, but they, you know, but we leverage their interest in the clinical trial. And if they're interested in being part of the clinical trial, we get them started um, and get them ramped up. And then they start enrolling patients into the study. And that's where our CRAs come into play. So our clinical research associates come into play here. And what I'll tell you about that, that role, it is such a critical role for us. Um, and I, I kind of term it as being more of that second pair of eyes for our sites, right? So as the sites start to enroll patients, um, they actually help the sites get up and running. And then they actually go out to the sites. Sometimes they're on site doing this work. Sometimes it's some of it's virtual, some, a little bit of blend of both. But they're out there actually ensuring that the sites are enrolling the appropriate patients into the trials, that the patients meet the criteria for the trial, that they're following the, you know, the visit um, frequency and the, the visit, you know, the procedures needed for that trial. In addition to making sure that we're capturing all the associated adverse potential events, serious adverse events. So our CRAs, our monitors are so critical for that role in ensuring patient safety through the clinical trial and also the data integrity. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to the panelists. Uh, we're gonna have them do a quick introduction of themselves. And then Christine's gonna you know, kick off with our first question. So we'll go, um, Alvita, I'll go with you first, then Tony, and then Michael for introductions. Sure. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Alvita Amanchuku. I am a manager of clinical operations with PRA Health Sciences located here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I've been in the industry for about 15 years and I am an alum of Campbell University. Hi everyone. My name is Tony Connell. I work uh, for Covance by LabCorp. I am a clinical research associate uh, based in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, and I've been with in the CRO industry for almost three years now. Hey everyone, I'm Michael Quinn. I'm with Cineos Health as a CRA. I'm in the general medicine division of our CRO. I'm based out of Chicago, Illinois, and I'm a graduate of College of Charleston. Thanks everyone. So I think to kick it off, we would love to learn more about your day-to-day -day job. So a little bit more detail on what's a CRA, what's, uh, how do you interact with colleagues? Um, I love when someone says, what's an average day? There's probably not an average day, but uh, as much light as you can shed would be great. Um, we'll go, um, we'll flip the order a little bit. This time we'll start with Tony. Thanks, Christine. Um, so actually, I am on site uh, traveling today. Um, I'm at a research clinic in Miami, Florida. And so I had a pretty normal day for a CRA, actually. So it was a good day. Um, but just to kind of give you a rundown of my day, um, I woke up around 7. Uh, I traveled to the site. I have a Starbucks, which is really nice. So I grabbed coffee and I checked, immediately started checking my emails and prioritizing what was important, what needed to be done this morning, and what could wait till later today or even later this week. Um, by that time, it was around 8.30. That's when my staff come on site. So I met with my study coordinator, the study nurse, and we talked about her schedule for the day, my schedule for the day, um, and how we can mesh those and get things done, what need, I needed to meet with her about, and what I could do virtually. Um, we also talked about when I can maybe meet with the principal investigator, who's the physician that's running the trial. Um, so by that time, that took around 30 minutes to an hour. Um, we had a lengthy discussion about some of the study subjects. I grabbed all my patient binders and regulatory binders, and I went down to the conference room that I had reserved, and I started reviewing the patient binders. So this is where I'm actually looking at, and for this site, actually, the paper, the medical re records are actually paper. Um, sometimes they're electronic, sometimes they're paper. So in this case, they're all paper. So I start reviewing the patient binders, and I have a list um, for my company, I can see when the patient came in for their visit or when they were supposed to come in. So I'm looking at their medical records and making sure that they came in for their visit. Was it on time? Um, did they 
perform all the procedures that were performed, by, such as vital signs, having their eye work in ophthalmology trials. So did they have their vision checked? Did they do all these? It's, it's several procedures that's in the protocol that they have to do at a certain time point. So I'm looking and making sure that it was all done. Was it done by the right person? And was it documented in the patient medical records? Then is all that data transcribed over to the data system that Covance uses to organize the data and eventually give it to the FDA um, at the end of the trial. Um, after I'm reviewing that, I'm looking for anything that's wrong. I did note a few things that are wrong. So I we call them queries. Um, I query the site in the system saying, please review this or please confirm this. You know, this doesn't look right. Um, I met with, I went back to my study coordinator and we sat down and kind of went through some of them. I told her, you know, what looked a little bit wrong, confirmed a couple of things. Um, she actually just forgot to document a couple of things in the binder. Um, you know, she's running, there's running so many trials at this site. So it's easy for, you know, there's room for error in some of this. So um, made sure that all the, the visits that happened recently were up to date. Everything was documented. Um, I then went and grabbed lunch. I came back and started reviewing the regulatory binder. Uh, regulatory binder is so important. I personally love the regulatory binder the most uh, because it tells the story of how the trial was managed. So this includes all your essential documents such as medical licenses, CVs, where the drug is stored at, how much the drug is there, um, 1572s, which if you work in the clinical research industry, you definitely know what a 1572 is. Um, so, and things are changing like constantly, right? Like if these trials are happening over a period of you know one to four years. So we need to be able to document that what changed in the trial, who came onto the study, who was treating the patients, who was performing the assessments, things of that nature. So reviewed the regulatory binder um, and noted a couple of things that were wrong there. Um, and uh, met back with my study coordinator and we talked about what was wrong and how this can be fixed. Um, then I uh, texted, actually I was on a texting basis with the principal investigator, he's really nice. Um, and I said, hey, you know, when can we get together and meet uh, to talk about some things that I went over today? And he texted me back and we actually, he's actually working from home today. So we met virtually and I talked about the things, I had a list of things that I had discovered um, that were wrong or things we needed to talk about. Uh, so we talked about those. We then talked about recruitment. Um, so at the beginning of each trial, the sponsor has a target number of patients that they want to enroll in the trial. So, um, and this side is actually on target to meet the recruitment. So we, I just checked in and say, you know, what are you doing to recruit these subjects? Um, are you having any issues with this? Are you dispensing the ICF and the, the alert card like they should be um, to confirm everything? Um, we then talked about the queries that I noted in the RAVE system. One of them actually was a protocol deviation where the site actually did miss one of the assessments by error. Um, so we noted that was a deviation, you know, and I retrained the site, you know, it's very important to follow the protocol. Um, this data is very important for the efficacy and safety of the trial. Um, after that, that was where my day got up. There was a little hiccup in my day. So with COVID has introduced a lot of challenges, one of those being lab kit supplies. Um, and at a lot of central labs, shipping has been delayed. So uh, we're having patients come in, but we don't actually have the lab kits delivered at the site to perform the blood, the blood draw, like the actual tube that they're using. So um, we know that we have patients coming in next week and the week after for certain visits that require these blood draws. So we talked about how can we mitigate that? If we have you know, a couple lab kits on site, can we take from some of those and combine them with, with other ones and use those? Each study is a little bit different, so you can't always combine your lab kits. Um, and so that's it was a really complex issue and it depends on each study, but um, that's where we got to really, I got to really dive in and we created a plan, you know, okay, we're going to do this to mitigate how we're going to miss these lab samples or, and then, you know, I'm, and then I get back to my computer and I e immediately email my project team who is sitting at their computers and I say, hey, can we get an update uh, when these lab kits can uh, be delivered to the site? So a little problem solution there. Um, after that, I had about an hour after I met with the principal investigator, I went back to um, my conference room and I documented everything that we talked about. Uh, the plan for the lab kits, the plans for subject recruitment, noted the deviations that were going to happen and that I retrained the site and we were, this is the plan moving forward. Um, I looked at the next visits that were coming in and just emailed the study coordinator, hey, you know, just a reminder, please call the patient and have the patient come in uh, for this visit. Um, and by that time, it was 4.30, 5 o'clock and my day was done. So I grabbed a second cup of coffee and I am now back in my hotel. So, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so there's, yeah, so I hope that was a good explanation of kind of what a day in the a day that was in the impressive second cup of coffee at 5 p.m yep <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Alvita, same question 
So I'm a little different than Tony. Um, so I was a CRA for about eight years, but um, through career progression in the clinical research industry, I'm now a manager of clinical operations of which I manage a team of CTMs, which <laughs> also then are the, um, the pretty much the trial managers for these studies that um, Tony is going out to monitor. So a day in the life of me, I do not travel as much. And of course, you know, with COVID now, I don't travel at all. But pre-COVID, um, you know, it would have consisted of me doing uh, major meetings. Um, we call them investigator meetings, or if we had a face-to-face -face with one of our sponsors or a client, um, major trainings or things of that nature. So I primarily work from home. Um, of my 15 years in the industry, I have been working from home 10 to 11 of those years. So <laughs> COVID did not change anything for me as far as you know that aspect and being virtual. I'm very comfortable in a, in a home office setting. Um, but the majority of my day is run by uh, emailed correspondence and meetings. Uh, so with my team, I have one-on-ones with them to make sure that their study is progressing as it should. Um, you know, If there are any major protocol deviations that come up or risk to timelines or budgets within the uh, within what has been scoped for that project. Um, they escalate it to me and we talk about it. We troubleshoot, you know, how can we get this back on track? Or if they run into a particular scenario with either one of their investigative sites or even an issue that they're having with a sponsor that they need to kind of figure out how to relay a message or how to manage their CRA team or, or what have you. We talk about those things and kind of come up with a strategy and best practice on how to execute. Um, in addition to that, you know, we, we have days that are filled with meetings at times as well. Uh, so meetings with the client, um, because we definitely want to know, you know, what the sponsor is looking for as far as the progress of their study, um, making sure that we are meeting their expectation and their deliverables. If there are new things that are coming up, changes to the protocol, um, changes to any spec specifications or vendors that they have um, that we need to know that information needs to be dis uh, disseminated down to the project teams. Um, as well as the CRAs and the sites. It would be Tony's job to uh, relay that message to the site. Um, you know, other than that, it's, I do a lot of relationship building <laughs> and a lot of coaching uh, in my role now, um, which I, you know, I think is great. And, you know, as a CRA, I was assigned to one to two projects. Um, and I've always been in the oncology space as well. Um, so dealing with uh, cancer drugs and immunotherapies. Um, but, you know, I would deal with like one to two studies when I was a CRA. However, now in the management role, um, I mean, I'm aligned across <laughs> across the board with all of the trials that my team are is participating in, and so you know, I, I love that as well to just kind of get a get a inside and knowledge on what's happening across the board um, in the oncology space, how things are progressing, and just kind of high level seeing um, you know the the strides that we're making in this industry, in the medical industry, and providing um, access to treatment for for our patients. So it's kind of my day. It's not as fun as, you know, traveling out and things like that, but still definitely with the uh, relationship building and, um, you know, meeting and troubleshooting uh, with, with my CRA teams and, and the CTMs as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Michael, uh, same question. Hey, everyone. This is Michael Quinn. Um, so on Fridays, we have big CRA team meetings, and that is led by our lead CRA and they will talk about any updates going on in the study and we'll also get these very large emails that show any pending issues with the sites across the board. So on Monday, after our CRA meeting on Friday, on Monday you'll just go and you'll filter and filter all of your sites on these big spreadsheets and you'll see what pending issues you have for your sites and then just follow up. So Monday and Tuesday for me, I'm not really traveling, I'm in the office, so I can go through and see what's pending for my sites and just kind of send that out to them. Troubleshoot, see if they have any questions. Um, you can look at the previous week and see if we've made progress or if we've gotten worse with pending issues. A lot of times the queries, the, the pending items, the issues that are wrong go up. So kind of figuring out what's going on. Wednesday is usually when I have to travel. So Wednesday and Thursday is my travel day. I'm on site. And just like Tony mentioned, it's basically the same thing. I'm on site right now, and today is our big IP review day. Especially with COVID, a lot of the pharmacies, we weren't allowed to go down and review the drug. So today, I am allowed. 
So we had about a year worth of medication to review and to um, destroy on site. You're reconciling the kits, um, like the drug numbers and which subjects they were assigned to and if they were expired. We had some that were damaged, the needles, they're uh, an injectable. So the needles were damaged, so we had to return those back to the depot. Tomorrow is back on site day and go home day. That's what I call it. So you'll fly back home and then Friday, we do it all over again and we'll have another CRA meeting and we'll have that Excel document with all the pending issues on Monday. So there definitely is a momentum. I like the momentum, but you're just going to get into a routine and you're just going to keep following up with these sites and presenting these issues. And you're just going to kind of be their advocate, help them resolve the issues, help them um, try to figure out maybe how to prevent future issues down the road. But uh, right now, I think the big focus at the site on that now is just reviewing all the drug, making sure that it's accounted for and that all the documentation is in place. This site's really good. We don't have really any issues. We're kind of in a maintenance phase because this site is uh, one of the largest that we have and they have been operating really well. And um, we're also doing a database lock right now. So those emails that we get that have all the pending issues, it's kind of a rush, rush, rush moment because we want to have all the data in, we want to have it reviewed, we want to have the PI, the main doctor, sign off on it, and then we want to lock it up so we can move on and find a new issue to worry about. Great. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, and so, so the next question uh, we kind of want to know from the panel is, you know, how'd you discover clinical research? I think we all have our story of how we got the foot in the door, what type of background we had um, and have. So I think it's great for this, this team to kind of, you know, let the, let the uh, audience know how they got into clinical research. So Alvita, maybe we'll turn it over to you first. Sure. Um, so I'm one of those unicorns that always knew I wanted to be in clinical research, <laughs> which is a rare find um, because a lot of people have, you know, either found out about it along the way or even stumbled upon it and, and decided to get into clinical research. However, um, in high school, I went to, <laughs> it's going all the way back there, um, in high school, I went to a science and technology school that required us to do a, um, a research project and a thesis um, to graduate senior year. Um, so I actually did my thesis with an aunt that was a uh, professor at the Medical College of Georgia. She did um, behavioral research studies, and it was something that I was very fascinated by and just kind of, you know, wanted to learn more about it. But one thing that I do really appreciate about that engagement that summer prior to my senior year was the fact that um, my aunt introduced me to her colleagues that were also within the Medical College of Georgia and allowed me to shadow them to see different aspects of the pharmacy industry. Um, so although she was a pharmacy professor, she did do, um, she had grants and ran research studies. There were others that um, did the same. And so one that I um, was able to shadow actually was a research pharmacist of a, um, a renal transplant plant clinic. So in shadowing her, I actually was able to tour the renal transplant clinic meet with her and her patients as she was discussing, you know, their drug accountability and how, you know, how they were taking the pills and how the pills were making them feel and, you know, the difference of that versus standard of care that they were used to. And just, you know, immediately seeing that interaction with the patients and the benefit that they were receiving from these drugs that weren't even on the market yet were fascinating to me. So... I decided that I, you know, I always knew that I wanted to go to pharmacy school. Um, so I pursued pharmacy school. Um, but at Campbell University, I found a um, degree program in clinical research. And so I structured my education towards that degree program. So I, um, through the School of Pharmacy, there was a Bachelor's of Science in Clinical Research. And so I went through that four year program, graduated. Um, I had an internship 
which was my entry into the industry. But to continue on my education, I did a master's in clinical research uh, with Campbell University as well at their RTP campus. Um, and so that was structured to where I could work during the day. And then it was a degree program for professionals of which we you know, had class and studied and things of that nature at night. Um, so you know, everything that I did was geared strictly towards entering clinical research. Um, I was just, you know, it's, it, I say it's always that one thing that kind of shifts the needle for you of what it is that you're passionate about and, you know, where you want your career to go. And that summer for me was it. So that's Great. my story. <laughs> Thank you. And Michael, same question. If you want to share your story. Sure. I think I took the long way, but <laughs> I, um, I really started to learn clinical research in my undergrad program. I studied public health. So if any public health majors out there, you know, you read a lot of research studies and you would start to see some of these, these, um, you know, trending language and, and phase three, phase two. And when it came time for me to do an internship in that program, I, I actually wanted to go into pharma sales, but from everything that I've heard about pharmaceutical sales, it really wasn't um, as clinical as I wanted to get and as involved as I wanted to get. So I found an internship. It was one of those standalone research clinics and just went in with a really great attitude. Didn't really know what I was getting into, but great attitude. Back then it was during the Ebola vaccine days. So very, very busy clinic and just helped out any way I could and learned and sat in on patient visits and asked questions and um, had a little bit of clinical experience because before undergrad, I did a um, like a technical degree as an EMT. So I could do blood pressures, I could do vital signs and uh, draw blood and administer vaccines. So huge help to that clinic. And I think just having that great attitude and wanting to get involved, because if you're wanting to work in healthcare, you definitely need to have that passion and that interest. So um, kind of took the long way because I was an EMT and worked in an ICU and wanted to go into nursing school. But then found public health and really enjoyed that and then kind of tweaked it into clinical trials. And I, I think clinical trials kind of hits all those bases of the clinical aspect, but then also the investigator research aspect of it too. And as a CRA, you know, you are kind of like a little mini epidemiologist on site. You're trying to find these trends and you're trying to find um, safety issues and present it to them present it to the doctors and you're going to be questioning the doctors, which is kind of uncomfortable a little bit, but you're going to ask them if this blood pressure is abnormal and if this trend is irregular. So um, I think just get out there and volunteer because it all really started with me not getting paid and going into this uh, research organization and just offering to help and learn. Great. Thanks, Michael. And then Tony, I'm going to turn it to you. Um, so I did not know that I wanted to go into clinical research. Um, actually, when I graduated college, um, I was working in legislative research for a little bit um, and wanted to get into something else. Um, I did not even know what a CRO was. In my mind, it was, I thought the pharmaceutical company or the medical device company or the biotech company did everything, that they ran the clinical trials, they made the drug, they marketed it, they ran the, the, the trial, they did the regulatory, I thought they did everything. Um, so when I was looking for a new position after I graduated uh, from the University of Memphis, I just Googled clinical research jobs and Covance uh, came up at the time, it was just Covance. And um, so I uh, looked at some positions there and I was comfortable with regulatory documents um, at, to some extent, because I've been working with it in, in policy research. And so I applied for an entry level uh, regulatory job, helping to get trials up and running uh, on the regulatory side. So collecting all their essential documents, their, you know, their CVs, their medical license, any uh, financial disclosure forms, you know, make sure that the investigator is, you know, doesn't have economic interest in the sponsor. Um, so collecting those and getting the, the sites really up and running and uh, many CROs and Covance by LabCorp has a whole unit dedicated to this is making sure that these trials are up and running um, and that the timelines are met so that we, we can get this drug to the market faster. And so um, that was what I did. I did that for a year and 
learned so much about the CRO industry. I remember asking questions in my interview. I just asked them, like, can you explain to me what this is? You know, like, like uh, the processes. Because the night before my interview, I read all of these FDA regulations I thought I had to know and was looking at all the good clinical practice and trying to memorize everything. So I, you know, w- would seem confident and in, in doing this. So, but um, it's, I've learned so much. I learned a lot in the interview that I had with my managers at the time. Um, and then being in the industry and being in that entry-level position was so important for me because that is where I really built the foundation. And that's why the regulatory binder is probably my favorite thing because I just feel like I'm a master of it. Um, but it's it really gave me the foundation right now to, you know, to be a good clinical research associate and be able to talk to those investigators and the nurses and, and say, you know, this is what this is what we need to do or this is what you're doing well or doing wrong. So, um, yeah, so that's how I discovered just by random Google search. So, um, yeah. That's great. Yeah, three three very different uh, pathways, um, and and that's a great segue to maybe share a little bit more in that area. So if we do um, have some folks in the audience that are not as familiar, and I'll I'll admit I didn't know I was the same as Tony. I didn't know that there were separate groups that did different parts of the process. Um, so if as a panel you could share some insights into what are those first roles that people should look for and. Um, you know, and then maybe shed some insight on um, you're not likely going to do be a CRA as your first job. So what are the best pathways if you want to get on that path of becoming a CRA? So um, Alvita, I'll, I'll have you go first this time. Sure. Um, so, you know, just like Michael, I started off as an intern. Um, so I did intern for um, a summer, a summer uh, before landing my first job. And so my first job was at a small biotech right here in North Carolina. um, And I was a clinical research coordinator. Um, The term kind of confuses people because what we typically say, when we typically say clinical research coordinators, we're referring to our site staff or our research nurses. However, at this particular organization, it was more of a um, project assistant role. Um, So my job was the regulatory, as Tony was was mentioning, uh, and also, you know, preparing our site materials and things of that nature. But being on the uh, biotech in and the the pharmaceutical in, I was able to also gain a lot of knowledge. And this was a oncology uh, research organization that I that I joined right out of college. I was able to gain that therapeutic knowledge of oncology and actually be trained by the medical directors that were you know writing these protocols and and doing those things. And so um, you know here again, you know as the panel has stated before, you know I think critical to my um, you know, advancement within the industry was just my me being a sponge and really trying to shadow and absorb as much as I could from those that I worked with. So while my, you know, entry level position was that of a research assistant um, or, you know, a project assistant, I was given the opportunity to co-monitor. So I would go out with other CRAs to, um, to do the regulatory portion of the, uh, the site visit, but I was afforded the opportunity to actually see what it was like to be on site as a CRA, um, to participate in submission activities with regulatory, uh, to help with database locks. So I was able to get a, um, an experience with the data management group as well. And all of these different aspects and components that make up the, you know, the clinical trial team as a whole, um, just really being able to you know, say, hey, you need help. I'll help whatever it is that I need to do because I wanted to know where I truly fit in this industry. And if it was, you know, going the route of CR of a CRA, or if it was that I wanted to, you know, be in pharmacovigilance and or just whatever it was, I I wanted to be able to learn as much as I could. So, you know, my advice to anyone um, getting into the industry is to truly, truly be a sponge and just absorb as much as you can that is around you from every avenue that you can. Yep, absolutely, completely agree. Um, Tony, same question. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a really great explanation, Alvita. I think like when you're being that sponge and, and asking those questions, um, like I said, I started out entry level and you know, I, I'm pretty ambitious. So, you know, I knew I wanted to go the CRA out once I discovered that that was what the role was. So I was constantly, you know, trying, okay, how, when can I be a CRA? Like, when can I be promoted? When can I start the training? And they're constantly trying to move as a forward as, you know, like being ambitious and wanting to advance in the industry. Um, but it is so important that 
you really be a sponge in that entry level position. I now I wouldn't I would never ever recommend going straight into the CRA route without having some sort of entry level experience. as a research coordinator or as a data manager or as a regulatory person or startup um, in any of the various roles in, in clinical research because. As a CRA, you are at the crossroads of a lot of different aspects of the trial. And so if you have experience from one, it can really help you uh, build knowledge on the other one. So I, guess I, I think the entry-level position is so important, and I would always recommend a go, going to the entry-level position for a year or two and really soaking up the knowledge that you learn from there, because that will really give you the foundation you need to be a successful CRA. Yeah, and they can they can tend to be called uh, maybe slightly different titles at different organizations. Um, Michael, anything that that you would add as far as entry level roles for people to be on the lookout for? Sure. Um, the the research coordinator role at these major hospitals at the at the smaller research sites that are busy, um, you're going to learn a ton there, and you're going to have a little blend of being a nurse being a teacher, being um, a little bit of a CRA because we had internal monitoring and audits that we did as coordinators. So the site definitely is gonna teach you a lot. Um, my background is really clinical. So I went into it with that knowledge and even learned a lot just being on site and working in different departments. Uh, my background was in cardiology. Um, I think, talking to people, doing what you're doing now, just kind of asking people's day in the life. Uh, when I was a coordinator, we had CREs that would come to the site and you would work with them a lot. Just like I work with sites all the time now, I would work with CREs all the time as a coordinator and asking them, how do you like your job? How did you get into that? Um, and I think when I was a coordinator, I was like a mini CRA. I was an advocate. I would always help my fellow coordinators. And now as a CRA, I do the same thing. You know, you're helping these coordinators resolve these pending issues. You're sending screenshots, you're copying and pasting things, and you're you're just trying to help them push this clinical trial up the hill, just like you did when you were a coordinator. So it's all about training and making things as easy as possible because it's really complicated and it moves really fast. So just trying to help them as much as you can. And that's who I was as a coordinator too. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind, I just, I do wanna build on that, um, Michael, as well. So, you know, we, we're, we're saying, you know, the entry level positions and really kind of gaining your footing and, and you know, when you, when you do get into the industry, but, you know, one thing that I do wanna point out as well is that when you are trying to make that transitional shift to a CRA, um, the majority of our uh, CROs now have robust training programs that they put you through that will help and teach you all of these term all the terminology that we are you know spitting out like it's you know a second language to us but there are there are great training programs at all of the organizations um, you know across the across the country that would allow you to you know really really have that that good footing they teach you how to write a report they teach you how to um, engage with your sites and and how to address those issues and things of that nature so definitely when you're making that shift to a cra lock in with a company that does you know have that training and will really help and support and foster you through um, your development as a cra i think that's instrumental and it'll only set you up for success down the road Thanks, Alvia. That, that is a critical uh, point. So thanks for, for bringing that up. Um, now, I'd like for um, all of you to share, and I'm going to combine a couple of questions here, but maybe two or three things that you enjoy most about your job in clinical research, and then maybe find one of the things that's the most challenging in your positions. So Tony, maybe I'll kick off with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say one of my favorite things about being a CRA is the relationship building that I have with the principal investigator and the research staff. Um, so, because because I am their point of contact for the CRO and the sponsor company. So whenever they have a question or they have an issue, um, they immediately email me or call me and say, you know, we have this issue. What can we do about it? How do we how do we mitigate? Um, I really enjoy helping people solve problems. And if we have an issue, how can we avoid it or how can we uh, how can we solve it? 
Um, and so when I'm going on site or I'm talking to the staff on the phone, I really enjoy that relationship building that I have. So that when I come back on site, they, you know, I'm always like, oh my God, it's so good to see you again. Let's, let's catch up. This is what we did at, at, my, last, at my last visit last month. What have you got for me this month? What can we do? So I really enjoy relationship building and problem solving and being a CRA allows me to do that um, because their, their, their clinical research industry is so complex. Um, so, and, and probably my second thing off of that is I do like to wear many hats. So coming out of college, I enjoyed science and I enjoyed a little bit of business, but I couldn't really pinpoint exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted a little bit of everything. Um, and like I said earlier, being a CRA, you were at the crossroads of so many different parts of a trial with data management, safety, regulatory, the drug being shipped to the site, monitoring, project management. You were kind of at the center of that. And so I get to do a variety of things on a daily basis. Um, and so sometimes I, you know, if I, I, I can really multitask, I can do six different tasks in one day. That's all relatively different. And I enjoy that part of a part about the trial. And that doesn't, it's not every day either um, that I'm doing those six different tasks, but I enjoy that because I get to wear many different hats and really build my skill set there. So I can say, yes, I've done this before. Yes, I've done this as well. Um, one of the most challenging things about being a CRA would probably be the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it really threw the clinical research industry for a loop because people have to travel to go to their patient visits. And some of these patients are coming from overseas. I have my study, 50% of the patients are from outside of the US. And so really created a challenge for us is how can we get these patients in because they're not being seen for standard of care and they're not being seen to collect the data either. For this research, and so um, that was a, that was really challenging. It's starting to let up a little bit, which is nice. Uh, but I would say global pandemics are definitely <laughs> the the most challenging part. And now you know, now we have these we have new policies in place and mitigation plans in at, at each different site and at the CRO to say if we go through this again, how do we mitigate this? How do we make sure that the patient is safe and that the data we're collecting is the utmost integrity? So. Um, that, that's where something too, where it comes to the relationship building, the whole team is talking, right? Like I remember when the restrictions came on place at one of my sites, the whole project management team got on a call on that Tuesday. And we had a meeting about, this is the action plan moving forward. This is what we're going to do here. Are the issues we're probably going to encounter. Let's go ahead and document these and see if we can get ahead of these. Um, so that was, uh, I would say those would be my, my two and my one. So, mm -hmm. That's great, Tony. Thanks for bringing that up. It, it certainly for the, for our series, it's been a, a year of navigation. Still is a year of navigation around COVID. I've been extremely impressed on how they've navigated the water. So, um, so Michael, I will uh, turn it over to you for your uh, two things you enjoy in clinical research, and then maybe one of your most challenging ones. Sure. Uh, two things I enjoy. I enjoy going on site. And I enjoy uh, working in a clinical team. Um, going on site is great. You're the most productive on site. We do work remotely too, but whenever not from home, it's going to be on site. So those days that I'm on site, I'll leave with um, pages and pages of notes. And you're going to use those notes to write your report. So um, just like today where I'm doing all the drug and reconciling and counting, you can't do that remotely. So it really is beneficial to go on site. And just like Tony said, building those relationships with the nurses and the PIs, and they're going to have questions for you. So it's great to kind of have that good relationship, that face-to-face -face interaction. You can share things that you're seeing from all your other sites, make sure everybody's on the same page. And maybe a site made a, a mistake, share that mistake with another site so they don't make it. Mm -hmm. Um, the team is really great too. Um, Sinios has a really uh, great staff. The team I'm on right now, everybody's really approachable. Everybody's willing to help out if you need coverage or if you need a little assistance here and there. So I really like that um, team environment that we have. You can text, message, instant message each other, um, especially coming from like a clinical nursing background. That's really important. Um, something that's difficult, I think it's patience. You got to be patient as a CRA and you're in a weird spot because you're in the middle and you'll have this sponsor, this pharmaceutical company who's demanding things. And then you have the site that 
you need to get it from. So you're kind of that in between that you have to soften it and you have to keep that good relationship and you need to get the job done. So that's a challenge. It's just being patient. And even me, because I'm cool, calm and collected all the time, but you still need to be patient. Some of these nurses are really, really busy and maybe they don't have the time to dedicate enough time to resolve the issue. So I think just making it as easy as possible and just being patient and always communicating with your team if you need help or need to escalate something or if you've tried to resolve an issue and it's still not being resolved, what else can we do? But um, I think it all comes back to just being their advocate. Yeah, completely agree. Alveda, you want to share? Yeah, you know, as a CRA, I loved the travel. I loved, um, you know, being able to have that relationship with the site. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, just seeing the impact on the quality of life of patients that have these chronic conditions is amazing. I was actually a part of a team that, um, that, actually had their drug go to market. And so when we went through that exercise, we had one of the patients that was on our study to come back and do a talk for the, for the group. And that was amazing. And it kind of puts into perspective what it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and really having that impact and, and, and seeing someone who was given a, a dire prognosis to be able to say, you know, I'm now I'm able to play with my grandchildren or, you know, do these things that I never thought I would be able to do again. It's amazing. And then to to, you know, just right now in the, in the, you know, the times that we're in, just seeing the marriage of technology and drug delivery and the way we're doing this new wave of like targeted therapies, it's amazing. It, like if you're a STEM person and I'm assuming because you're on this call, you're really into STEM, just watching how, you know, this is, this is really transforming how we're delivering drugs to patients and how quickly we're able to, you know, tackle these, these diseases that, you know, have, there's been times where they've been on several different combos and none of them truly work. They just suppressed. And so to really see these targeted therapies that are, are actually working and, and doing great things is, is amazing. Um, as far as challenging as challenges are concerned, um, you know, competing priorities, I would, I would say not only for, you know, your, yourself as one that is on, you know, multiple studies or having different deliverables that are um, all geared around the same time, but then to, you know, to what Michael alluded, competing priorities of your site as well. So you may need something done right now because that's your deliverable. However, they may have, you know, five other things that they need to do for other studies that they're involved with, not to mention a patient in the clinic and <laughs> something that they have to do for their doctor and their administrative paperwork and things of that nature. So, you know, just being able to navigate those competing priorities is always a little difficult, but you get through those challenges too. I think that's a great place to transition to some of the questions that we have had all of our attendees submitted. I have to say your enthusiasm about your, your roles and your positions, I think is really contagious and hopefully is inspiring some of our attendees to, to want to continue to learn more. So one of the questions that I think you all started to address, but it has gotten a lot of likes. And so I know there's a lot of interest around it. So we're just gonna revisit is around what kind of experience is needed for entry-level CRAs. So now that our attendees maybe have a chance to get out a pen and paper, um, could you all just um, mention again, some of those entry-level roles and fields of study as far as your education. And we'll just, we'll cycle through since I know you all have had different experiences. And um, at the end, I'll give Dana and Christine a chance to weigh in too, since they have their, their perspectives as well. So Alvita, would you mind just giving your, your quick take on educational background for a CRA sure. and um, good entry level kind of career experience to, to work into a CRA? So you definitely need experience, um, you know, with medical terminology and, you know, some sort of life science. Um, so that's number one. So whether you go the clinical research route, whether you were in nursing or, um, you know, public health or what have you, you definitely need that type of background. Um, as far as entry level, as I stated, I came into the research industry as a clinical research coordinator, but on a sponsor side, um, so more of a project as associate role. Um, but here again, being a clinical research coordinator on the sites um, end is also a great path of entry as well to give, give you that working knowledge of, um, you know, just what is that day-to-day -day, um, in with 
regards to a research trial. That's great. And before we turn to Tony and Michael, I will say to all of our attendees, if you haven't had a chance to peek at the Q&A, I recommend you do so now and upvote those questions that, that are really inspiring to you because we have so many that I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. So please do take a peek at that. Um, Tony, what about you? What Can you just reiterate again, kind of educational background and entry level or other professional experience that is important for stepping into a CRA role? Yeah, so my degree is in uh, bachelor's in healthcare administration from the University of Memphis. I worked as a pharmacy technician for three years in college. So that really gave me the medical terminology um, foundation that was very helpful as a CRA now when I'm looking at patient records. Um, as far as experience, I have no clinical research experience going into the role. My first role in the CRA industry was a startup associate. Uh, so that was the regulatory, that was the title of my position when I was in the regulatory uh, department, helping get the trials up and running and activated. Um, so that they could begin enrolling patients uh, into their trial. Um, from that, I went into the in-house CRA role, which was the uh, robust training program that Covance by LabCorp has. And that was a year long position where I really learned how to be a CRA. I went on site with CRAs and co-monitored and see how they worked. Um, and I did a lot of the in-house work as of working from home. Um, so that was the title of the, the robust training program that Covance by LabCorp has. Thank you, Tony. Michael, do you have anything else to add? Um, I would just say if your resume, um, I, would, I always struggled with building my resume. And finally, I had managers and basically slapping me in the face. Hey, why don't you put this on your resume and put this on there? We did this. But anything that's really focused on data, um, data, like attention to detail, data entry, um, maybe you did a CPR class. That's all clinical. That's all data related um, experiences that you may have had that you don't think are really worth putting on your resume, put it on there and um, really stress any clinical or any like data entry, um, data analysis, because that's what ultimately CREs are doing. We're looking at trends and we're looking at possible errors and we're, we're just fixing it or even project management skills because that's at the end of the day too what we're doing is fixing project management issues with sites but um continue to ask questions and continue to get involved you know my story i started with volunteering i took a more clinical background so you can do that um i think if you're in an undergraduate program i think that too is a great foundation to reach out to your local community and um, look at entry level jobs in clinic or maybe in a project management sense. Thanks, Michael. Thinking about resumes, I think Michael just had a couple of recommendations. Are there other tips that you all have about how to prepare a resume that'll really shine whenever folks are seeking CRA roles? Christine, I think maybe you would have some, some good perspective maybe to shed on this. Yeah, I would, so I would say um, my favorite type of resume, if I could type it, is a skills-based resume. So these resumes are very um, functional and that it's a great way for you to highlight transferable skills. So if you're reading through a job posting and to Michael's point, you've got some experience in data and other areas, that's a highly transferable skill. So I'd love to see a resume that's laid out with, um, if you want to have a summary statement, no more objective statements, bye-bye to those. So if you want to have a summary statement that's just a very quick, here's who I am, then lead into kind of a skills or a competency-based section. And then from there, um, either lead into your experience, if that's more relevant, or your education, if your degree program aligns. But I always recommend having your, the job description on one side of your screen and then your resume on the other side and work back and forth between the two. So your job description, that's a great way, that's a tool that you can use to build your resume. And if you get your resume to a point where you can then very easily as you apply to new roles, look at the skills that repeat in the job description because job descriptions are very similar to resumes. They're, you'll see the same things repeated and you'll, you'll kind of start to note, these are the things, okay, I can tell these are the critical areas that they're really looking for. So what have I done or what do I have in my background that aligns really well? And if you get your resume to that baseline point, 
it's then really easy to update it every time you apply to a new role. Um, and I would say update your resume every time you apply to a new role. Great advice. Alvita, do you have anything to add to that? Just knowing that you have both applied to be a CRA and have probably reviewed many CRA applications. Yes, <laughs> and interviews. <laughs> um, but, you know, one that stands out, you know, you don't want to just kind of get lost in the sea of black and white. <laughs> so color is always great. <laughs> Um, but then too, you know, as, um, as Christine said, you know, one that is not just kind of bulleting, um, you know, every single thing that you've done, but if you truly are focusing on those transfer, um, transferable skill sets, um, and also, you know, your style and your leadership style and your management style and, you know, your communication style, all of those things are very important when you are um, having relationships with these sites. I heard one of you mention transferable skills in your comments. I think that that's, that's another question I see here is about kind of key transferable skills. Maybe, uh, Michael, could you maybe speak to some of the transferable skills that you're using now that you've also used in some of the other roles that you've had in your career? Sure. Um, let's see. Um... I think just really having a great attitude is a, a huge skill. Um, being flexible, being able to get along with a lot of people quickly. A lot of times you're going to be going on site and meeting people that you've never met before. So you have to be able to work well with others. And uh, I think coming back from an ICU experience or an emergency room, you might have new nurses that you've never worked with before. So, you know, finding the art of barking orders or taking orders from somebody, but doing it in a respectful, genuine way means a lot. And that's something you're going to have to do as a CRA. You're going to have to question things and you have to do it in an artistic way because you can't do it in a, in a, a brutal sense. You have to do it in a, I'm helping you manner. Uh, so that's, that's a big one. I think is just your ability to work well with others. Um, technically, I would say just the science background. I mean, not science being like biochemistry science, but science being like I'm analyzing things. I'm looking for trends. I'm looking for errors and just being really detailed oriented and knowing what you're looking at too, knowing what a normal blood pressure is, knowing what an abnormal blood pressure is, knowing what metformin medication is and, and why is a patient taking that? And what would I expect to see with another diabetic medication? So little trends like that is what CRE life is all about. And you're smarter than you think. You know this stuff more than you think you know it. And when you're flipping through a patient's chart, you're looking at all those points and you're kind of making it all come together. And I, I'm amazed by myself when I'm down at the pharmacy and I'll see kit 62742 and I can remember, oh yeah, that was visit nine. <laughs> we injected that drug. But that's why you're there. That's why they're sending you out there. And um, I think just the transferable skills would be uh, wearing many hats, like Tony mentioned, um, and just doing it as well as you can. And also, um, I guess, just um, just uh, asking for help when you need to and asking questions. We're, we're not experts in any field. My background's in cardiology and now I'm working in an allergy and immune area of general medicine. So this is definitely not my background. Now I've been doing it for three years, so I, I like it and I get it, but you're not going to be doing something that you're an expert in, and that's okay. And even when you go and meet some of these doctors, they know that you're not an expert. So even ask some of the nurses and some of the doctors questions. What, what is this and why do we do it like this? Um, I think that's what makes a good CRA because you're questioning things. I think that's great advice. I really, I'm looking at how many questions we have left, but I'm also looking at the clock. And I know that um, I've so enjoyed hearing from all of you and, and hearing your perspectives. And I think that for future conversations, we are going to have to enable even more time for questions because there are so many good ones that we are just not gonna have the chance to get to. But I, I want to, of course, give a huge thank you to our panelists, 
to our moderators and to all of our attendees for, for joining us tonight. And again, for those phenomenal questions. Um, there is linked here our website ncbiotech.org slash CRO and you'll find some information there that will help to address some of these questions that we weren't able to get to tonight. And we also have our next career conversation coming up just next month that is focused on clinical research coordinators. And I know that you've all heard a little bit about um, that position tonight. And I saw a number of questions asking for more clarity on that in the, the question box as well. So we hope to see you, see some of you again next month. And please keep an eye out in your emails for a, um, for a short survey, just asking for a little bit of feedback on tonight's event so we can make the next one even better. Thank you again to all of you and have a wonderful